Hello, welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast, hosted by me, Jack Perks. Professionally, I'm a wildlife cameraman, but I dabble in podcasting, and each Tuesday we release an episode as I have a chat with scientists, artists, filmmakers, and passionate people all about nature in a light-hearted and certainly not serious way. Hello and welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast. I'm your host, Jack Perks. Now, if I sound a little bit groggy, it's because I am literally just getting over the flu. If you've never had the flu, you're very fortunate. It absolutely floored me. I've had COVID three times. This was way, way worse. For me personally, it was worse anyway. I couldn't move. My bones were aching. Um, I had no motivation. It was horrendous. So if you're eligible for a flu jab, this is a public health announcement. It's not what you tune in for this for, but I would say get yourself a flu jab. And even if you're not eligible, you can still get a flu jab. I will certainly be getting one from now on because I've never known anything like it. It was horrific. Um, anyway, that's my excuse for why I sound, sound groggy. In today's episode, I was talking to Rupert Collins. Now, Rupert is the creator at the Natural History Museum for Ichthyology. So he deals with all the fish. And he was very kind enough to invite me to go to behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum and go and see what's called the tank room. And it's basically a room full of specimens, all the weird and wonderful stuff that gets sent into them, that gets collected is there. So I was like a kidney candy shop in today's episode as I headed down to London to go and see all that. Now as always, if you can support the podcast via buymeacoffee.com, that is I'm struggling to talk. <coughs> oh god, I thought I was going to get it all out then. Oh. <laughs> oh, I am feeling a lot better now, but the the chesty cough's still there. Um if you can support me and and help me afford healthcare, um, that's great. Uh, buy me a coffee is, is the only way that I get any money from this podcast. I'm not sponsored. That means I'm independent and I can say and do what I like. So if you can donate something to buymeacoffee.com uh, to help keep this podcast going, that is greatly appreciated. I'm also going to start doing something um, a bit different at the end of podcasts where I'm going to suggest a video for you guys to watch from my YouTube channel because I realise there's like, I think there's 850 odd vids on there. So it's a lot to sift through. Um, but I'm going to kind of pick some of the best ones that I would suggest you guys to, to go and have a look at. And if you're feeling particularly generous, you could subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is called Chasing Scales. Back on to today's episode. So I headed down to London to go meet Rupert. I've always wanted to see behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum. They've got some incredible specimens there. If you're an angler, that's where the rod caught records get um, verified there. Sometimes some of the record fish get sent there. There are some really, really special specimens. Special specimens. It was just just incredible. Just absolutely incredible to see some of these species and the size of some of the fish in there. Some of them that are quite significant in angling history as well as just general weird and wonderful stuff. So it was an incredible experience. Here's our chat. So Rupert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Do you want to just say who you are, where we are and what you do? Okay, so I'm Rupert Collins, I'm Senior Creator of Fishes at the Natural History Museum in London, and today we are in the Tank Room, which is our behind-the-scenes large wet collection storage area where we, where we keep all of our biggest spirit specimens. When I mean spirit specimens, these are specimens preserved in, in fluids, and particularly in alcohol. It is a sight to behold. That's why it's a little bit echoey if you're wondering why it's a bit like that. I don't think I've ever seen this many dead fish in one room, which I suppose is maybe not that surprising. And everywhere I look, I keep my eyebrow keeps twitching, like, oh, that's something unusual, that's something unusual. Um, I mean, where to start? So h- how do you preserve them then? Because they're all in this sort of kind of uh, sepia-looking liquid. Mm. So how, what's, what's stopping them from turning into mush? So, I mean, effectively, this is an experiment that has, is still ongoing. And <laughs> the very first human anatomists back in the sort of 1600s started experimenting with preserving human body parts in, in spirits, in alcohol. Um, before that, specimens tended to be dry. We got, we got a fairly large dry collection of fish as well, and that's the sort of the, the typically mostly Victorian taxidermy. 
But in general, we've over the years moved over towards spirit preservation, which is, seems to be the best, most effective way of preserving a specimen um, for a long period of time. And it's, I mean, some of these specimens you know date back to the late 1700s. Wow! Um, and they're still still in very good condition today. Um, the thing that mostly influences the quality of the specimen today is the quality of the specimen when it went into the jar right okay so if it was a ropey specimen that went into the jar back then it's going to be a ropey specimen today but if a a perfect specimen goes in went in initially then it's still going to be in good condition at the moment um one unfortunate downside of using alcohol is it leaches the color yeah they all they all look a bit um muted i think it's a polite way of putting it beige (laughs) various shades of beige which is a yes, yeah, a function of the of the alcohol, which which extracts the um, better a beige fish than no fish, though. Exactly, but you you even you you can see the colour pattern, especially blacks, the black pigmentation, mm. melanophores. You can you can you can still make those out on sort of two hundred year old specimens. So the black wow. coloration is usually the last to go, um, but red sort of colours, more vivid colours like red, um, generally go within often within sort of hours or days of being. Oh, fixed. really? Um, so nowadays we try and see, photograph everything before we before we preserve it while it's alive. And but before the before the advent of cameras, people would just write descriptions. What colour it is? They'd even yeah. have sort of colour reference charts of how to describe different colours and, and what that means. And there's a whole sort of taxonomy of colours yeah. that they used to use for describing specimens. Probably more so for um, for flowers and plants than for fish, mm. but it was. It was used for fish, and you know, Charles Darwin had a had some quite detailed notes. And we have some of Charles Darwin's fish. Really? He oh God, well, over, over if that's not a segue, I don't know what is. Let's go and have a look at Charles Darwin's fish. How, how many specimens have you got here? You, you must have absolutely thousands, surely. We have 1.2 million fish specimens okay, approximately. I was, I was a little bit off. That's <laughs> <laughs> not in this room. This is no, I was going to say. <laughs> seven floors in this building. Wow. Um, and the fish are... We have three and a half or two and a half floors of fish, and that is five and a half kilometres of shelving, and about 150,000 jars, and about over a million, about 1.2 million specimens, approximately, because they have not all been counted. So how, uh, we're just standing in front of Darwin's fish, but before we talk about that, how do you choose one fish from another? Like, is it like, well, this is a nice looking fish, this fish, no way. Like, how, how, are, you, how are you picking them? It is, it has, over the years, has changed quite Dramatically, yeah. how fish are collected. Back, you know, when the when the main collecting boom happened, sort of mid eighteen hundreds in Victorian period, there was a very much a sort of religious kind of, um, you know, God made the world and all its creatures, and we're just here to, you know, collect one of each. Okay, and that was effectively their goal. You know, they would collect one of each different species, and then once they got you know, an example of that in a museum, they try and collect the next one together. You it's know, like extreme of, twitching. Yeah, all of God's creatures under one roof. Um, and over the years, that has, you know, changed dramatically now until we sort of, you know, all of our collection is research-driven. Yeah. And we, we collect things that are, you know, we don't need another, um, probably don't need to collect another roach or something, for no, instance, okay, just for yeah. the sake of having a roach. Yeah, yeah. But then, but having said that, time series are quite interesting. If you have, you know, roach collected over... So if there's any change in genetics or whatnot. Exactly, and yeah, lots yeah, of pollution yeah. and all these kind of things. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's good, but we, generally there needs to be a reason to okay. collect something. That, well. that makes sense. So we don't just sort of go around, you know, depleting the seas. No, well, that, that, that's very good of you. So we've got, <laughs> we're looking at some fish here. So th- this one's Latin name. I'm not even going to attempt, uh, try, 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 try. <laughs> Trocopus Darwinii. Trocopus Darwinii. I could probably manage Darwinii. Okay, mm-hmm. so this is, this is Darwin's fish. He collected this today, or he discovered it? Or? That would be collected... At Collected by Darwin and named after Darwin. Yeah. And what's more, these are type specimens. So all of these, um, all of these jars with yellow, um, yellow lids. Yeah. This means they are type specimens. A type specimen is are the the original specimens, the unique specimens that were used to describe that species. So if you want to describe a new species, you have to you have to give it a name. Okay. And so if you want to give a new species a name, you have to have some specimens that you're basing that name upon. Right. To proof, I guess. To prove, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Just as a reference. Basically, there's reference points for that species. So Got yeah. That, so, for example, this, yeah, this is Trocopus darwinii. Can't, that name, Trocopus darwinii, can't apply to any other 
fish, any other no. species than this one here. You can infer that other ones you collect from the wild belong to the same species as this one, but that's that's just an inference. But this one is the one that has the name. So there's only one specimen that gets the name. Got you. But and the rest are just assumed to be belong to the same species, which usually in most cases is is accurate. Is, is accurate. Yeah. But sometimes it gets it gets kind of confusing when you've got you know badly preserved yeah, cool. specimens or juveniles or, or juveniles that happened, a, happened yeah. an awful lot. They would they would be describing females, juveniles, yeah. males, all different we, sizes. If you read some of the old British um, freshwater fish books, they, they've, there's about a half a dozen extra cyprinids, and they're all they're either hybrids or, or juveniles that they've... I can't, I can't remember some of the names off the top of my head. But yeah, just, just a few extras, and you're just like, well, where's that gone then? And yeah, it's obviously they've just got a little bit muddled. Trout are the worst. Yeah, oh god, brown trout. Now, you feel free to correct me. Brown trout are the most genetically diverse vertebrate. Is that, is that right? That wouldn't surprise me. Okay. I might be making I that up. Feel free to fact check me. <laughs> I'm sure I heard that somewhere. I don't know that for a fact, but... Okay. If some, yeah, but they do come in a lot of shapes and sizes, don't would they? Not so. be, would not be surprised. They've okay. Got a, got a very large area of distribution. Yeah. And, there's, and they are very... They've got strong yeah, fidelity like to their... Ferox compared to like a highland burn trout or something they're gonna because exactly, yeah. some of them have even got is it like gillaroo and they have all these weird names don't they and um Charles especially chardu yes yeah yeah, yeah. so it's, there's a big debate at the moment as to whether you regard all these different yeah. morphs you tend to call them as different species. yeah yeah, yeah. So there's, a, there's quite a yeah it's, there's no right or wrong answer no you can have you know you can just say everything from this lineage even if it's diversified into little into slightly different forms or even very different forms they look different they all belong to the same lineage and they're all just one variable species yeah or conversely because each of these different variable forms has its own evolutionary history and it's yeah. a different species there's no there's no hard and fast definition of what a species is no it's just something that's you know useful a, by a humans. certain group of people because I, I know this happens a lot with white fish as well you know oh, the, the, the fish, yeah. <laughs> your face then like with um, in Wales it's Gwynead in Scotland, it's Powan, and in England, it's Shelley. Mm. But if you ask one scientist, they're all the same species. If you ask another fishery scientist, they're all different species. And yeah. I've not really been able to get a straight answer out of any. That's because <laughs> there isn't one. Basically, okay. it's it's there's like yeah, it's a sort of school of thought that says the species aren't real. Oh, okay. They're just a useful. I mean, I I, I probably there's a bit of truth in that. I think. I think there's they're just a useful tag. Yeah, things, cataloging tool. Sense. Makes sense, yeah. but sometimes it just gets super messy. Yeah, I, yeah, I can imagine. Um, when when things, it's parallel evolution is the messiest yeah. of them all. So you get these, especially with things like whitefish and chars, is you get one ancestor who was present, who was sort of everywhere. Yeah, it was yeah. present everywhere, and then the ice sheets retreated in the last ice age and left all these separate populations of um, whitefish that colonised all these all these lakes, the alpine lakes, especially all across Europe. Across the UK, Scandinavia, Iceland, whole of Europe is the same, and they had, and then each of them start evolving into separate, yeah, separate forms within the lake. So you get the shallow water forms, you get the deep water forms, you get the perseverous predatory forms, and they all start parallel evolving into into very similar things. So you get something that looks quite similar between one lake and another lake. But it not, doesn't have yeah. a shared evolutionary history. It's more related to the thing that looks less similar to them. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, you yeah, know, I, I see what you're saying. And how do you put names on that? Then it's, it gets very complicated. Yeah, I'm glad I don't know it. <laughs> so but it's it's very difficult to yeah to, no, I, to, I, to deal with these problems because you want to recognise the genetic and evolutionary diversity of these animals. Yeah, of course, which is what we want to do. But at the same time, you want to cause yourself an absolutely huge headache in the process. <laughs> and so a lot of these. Yeah, a lot of the Victorian scientists had described many of these you know, localised populations of whitefish and chars and trout as being different and gave them all names because they're absolutely obsessed with describing lots of, yeah, yeah. Lots of new things. It sounds good names. if you've discovered 20 species or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. trout have the, I think a trout have the record as well, I think, for the largest number of synonyms. So a synonym is when... So if you describe a species and then someone else goes ahead a few years later... And describes the same is not from well it could be from the same specimens that has happened quite a lot but let's assume they're from different specimens but of the same species and they think they're different but they're you know later on we find out that they're probably not different what happens you've got two different names that apply to the same things so it's always the 
oldest name that has the precedence. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so the younger name, it's called it gets sunk. Yeah. That's what we say. So the younger name is a synonym of the older name. But what happens if suddenly later on and someone, you know, decides, oh, maybe they were right, maybe it is a valid species, then that becomes, suddenly becomes unsynonymized and it becomes its own valid name again. Got you. No longer a synonym of the other name. It gets confusing. So, but when you, <laughs> the trout, I think, have the largest number of synonyms. Wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't just shock so me. All across Europe, people are describing new, di- every slightly different trout. And um, but in many cases, what's happening now is we're finding out that a lot of times they are actually different. There so might be the, something in it. These yeah. old synonyms are actually valid species, yeah. so they've been resurrected. And yeah, we get this. Um, I mean, it's not. It's not too difficult in sort of southern Europe when you have you know, ice age. They didn't have a ice age um, ice sheets down there, so they would have been things would have been fairly well separated. So you can, you know, some. The trout in one river in France or something is different to one in Spain, and there's a it's, they have a longer history of being separated. But up in so say in the in the north in the UK, this evolution has happened very quickly. Yeah, which is very interesting because you kind of assume that all this like you know evolution happens in other places, happens in the yeah. tropics. It happens here, but it we happens here it. Yeah, super yeah. fast because yeah. these are new habitats that have effectively been created yeah. in the last you know hundred thousand years. So and evolution is just like just going for it now and producing yeah. loads of new new animals and they're all and what what we see in the in sort of fairly deeper history is all of the sort of the messy bits all the intermediate forms all the different population stuff eventually they you know one by one they go extinct and you're left with just a little sort of what's sort of been filtered yeah and you have like the the cream managed to su- survive and through you know luck or sort of you know Evolutionary um, adaptations that suit their environment and let them, you know, let them survive in a sort of Darwinian sense. And you get those, you get those ones that have survived, and that's what you see. And it's kind of, it, it looks, it, it, it's easier to, to sort, yeah, and to categorise things when you can see that, you know, all the mess is gone, and you're just left with different things that look quite different to each other. But when you've got all these events happening at the time. And you're seeing all these different types of fish, all these different forms, morphs appearing to fill these different habitat niches, then it becomes you know, very it's difficult. So there's no right or wrong answer. So people who... No. You know, it's okay. just, we're just putting names on, basically on populations that have their own individual evolutionary history. And that's entirely up to us to decide what, what, what they that are. is. So you've got a couple of specimens out already, mm. and it's sort of a... Not an impossible task because you've got so many things, but I think we're on the same wavelength because I was secretly hoping you would pick this fish and you've, you've read my mind. So we've got two specimens in jars here. Can you just describe what they are? So, two specimens. One was collected in 1907. One was collected in 1908. And it kind of... If you look, if you, um, if you look at them and, and you sort of... You showed someone who didn't know all that much about fish. You think that kind of looks like a, or they know a little bit about fish. You say it looks like a haddock, yeah, or a cod. But this one was collected in Thetford in Norfolk. And this one was collected in River Ouse in Kings Lynn, also in um, in Norfolk, I think, or maybe Cambridge in Cambridge. King Lynn's Norfolk, no, Norfolk, Nor- yeah. Norfolk, yeah. So yeah, so you got these. Um, it's this sort of like cod-like fish collected from. Um, collected from East Anglia in the sort of turn of the um, 20th century. So what are they? So they, these are, obviously you know what they are, because you're... I'm, I've got them. a clue, I've got a clue. Yeah, they're, they're, they're burbot. Yeah, they, <laughs> they're... Um, so, the, and so these are British burbot that were swimming around in, in an English river, yep. um, you know, a little over 100 years ago, and now they're in a jar. So, do you yeah. know the story behind them? Do you know how they got here? No. You don't? Um, there <laughs> okay. may be, there may be some extra information. It's all of... There's only so much one man can know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we have a we have a database and we have um, written records of a lot of specimens that yeah. come in. We have a, a big we have these big books of all the. I mean, it's all it's all done digitally now on on, um, on our database. But historically, there's a big big book and you and you'd write down write the details of the, the collection in the book. Sometimes they write a lot of information. Yeah. And other times Sometimes they write and there's nothing. Here you go, so, take these. Um, it all depends. There might be a little bit more information associated with these in the book. So the one on the left, which is the the one from the FET, this is the bigger of the specimens. And what, what would you say? I mean, certainly over a pound, isn't it? I, I don't know. Oh, yeah. What, what do you reckon? Closer to two? Oh, maybe three. 
three. Three, okay, let's I go know, for I'm it. Always... <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a big, it's a big, yeah, it's a chunky old, chunky, you know, chunky background. fish. Um, I you would be disappointed if you caught that one. No, 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 that's amazing looking what thing. I do know, it was presented by, um, is that a Mrs? Mrs. T. Wright. Was oh. Is that a Mrs. or is that a Mr.? Oh, I don't know, I'm, I'm oh, the, dyslexic on the best today, so um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're on your own. It's, um, it's, it's difficult yeah. to read, but... Um, yeah, so we do, we do know where it was caught. It, well, where it was caught. I mean, you who? I say, oh no, this is purchased, not presented. So someone uh, someone sold this to the museum. Uh, okay. a lot of, it doesn't so much happen anymore because like novel fish don't have a huge amount of value these days. No, 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 no. Um, but in but back in the day, it was quite common for you know for fish or, or animal dealers to exist. There was a lot. Of really, we just that would be there's a market. For it. Yeah, yeah just go out and find specimens and sell them to museums and. Um, yeah, so a lot of our specimens were collected, well, Bought. presented, yeah. purchased by dealers. It's, well, it still happens in paleontology. Yeah, yeah oh, I bet it's it does. It's got a yeah. huge yeah, yeah, yeah. business, and like a lot of um, the paleontology curators will be out, you know, buying buying specimens that they think um, will be valuable to the museum. We don't do that in fish. Um, most, no. most of the, the fish that come here are, are donations, or we collect them ourselves. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're incredible. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd ever really see a. This? British bird, but hopefully we won't have to wait too much longer for it to see a live yeah, one. This here. one came from the Fishmongers Company. The, oh, that's uh, yeah, um, the Guild of Fishmongers in the. Um, that's in London, isn't it? Is that the Tower Bridge? No, yeah, London Bridge. London Bridge, yeah. Bridge. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow. Okay. So, so, yeah, so, so we've had a long relationship with them with them over the years. Yeah, I bet you have. And they, they've given us a lot of um, specimens that have been that have come across their way. They're quite mottled, aren't they? This really, this one's very I mean, mottled. Yeah, yeah. there's quite a variation in coloration. So I say that often. Fish tend to go very beige, but this one, this one's kept its. Yeah, to say it's over a hundred years old, I, I would say yeah. they're in, they're both in pretty good, yeah, pretty good nip. Yeah. But that's amazing to to this see one has them. A few spots on its yeah on its back. Wow. So these were the these were the, some of the last verifiable specimens. Um, yeah, we were talking we about this specimen. earlier, weren't we? Yeah, like nineteen seventy nine, maybe. But the, the thing is, if you. It, it becomes very difficult to authenticate claims of, yeah. of Berbers, even photographs. You know, it's, you think nowadays people are, you know, it's easy to fake photographs of fish now with, you know, sort of AI and, and, and photoshopping and things. But it was just as, you know, it was just as popular back then and people could have, you know, in, the, in the 70s, could have just taken a picture on a holiday in Sweden or um, the USA and, oh, just get a picture of this Berber I just caught. Let's just, just wind a few people up in the UK and... and <laughs> And yeah, you've you've no way of knowing, but there's been some relatively you know, sort of plausible so, claims. It, it seems from the from the information that around 1970 was the yeah the last. So although it might seem gruesome, killing the fish and, and pickling it, it, you can confirm what it, there's you know there's a reasonably good chance that's from the UK. But, I mean, I suppose now you could even do genetic tests, can't you? Oh, yeah. So even if you were paranoid about someone bringing it in. You could do a test on it, like, well, we know that this is from. In fact, someone has actually done that. Oh, have they? Um, I don't know who. I can't remember before my time, but Tom Worthington, by any chance, is it? It could have been. So there's a little. um, Oh yeah, he's got a chunk just behind his fin missing. missing Behind his fin. Yeah. So someone's obviously taken a little bit of DNA sample at some point. Yeah. For that very purpose. Um, So I mean, there's no reason to doubt that in 1907 these have been. These been. That would. That would make yeah, sense. Unauthentic specimens, but as you, as we got a bit later on, and people started realizing that burbot were rare and special, then it was more chance of some sort of hoaxes and yeah. Hoaxes. There's always someone looking for five minutes of, uh, five of minutes fame, isn't it? And the angler in me. So I wasn't expecting to see this today. So what is the other thing that you've that you've popped out for us to ah, see? So any carp anglers that are listening will be more more than familiar with Clarissa, who was. I think I could be wrong, but I probably the first carp that got a name. I, I, that would make sense. Yeah, I, I don't know of any earlier than that. I know. I'm sure there are some carp fishing historians that would know, like Bob the Carp or something before <laughs> that. <laughs> no, but <laughs> someone may have thought. But I think she sort of kicked off the the let's give carp names trend, yeah. which has sort of died. Yeah, not not died at all. It's ever ever more popular now. So, so Clarissa, give me some. Some history on her. I'm just opening a, opening a little pot. So this is not all of Clarissa that's here. Just a very, very small part of her. So she was just reading the label in here. So out of the way. 
She was caught in 1952 at Red Mile Pool, the very famous um, carp venue on the Welsh border, um, by Richard Walker, Dick Walker, as, as everyone knows, and she weighed 44 pounds, which is 19 kilos. Big she, fish. She was an absolutely gorgeous fish, one of the leany strain of, um, of common carp that were very that grew very large and were particularly attractive and very popular around the time, and still are. And then, yeah, she was transferred subsequently to London Zoo Aqu- Aquarium, where she, I think she lost a fair bit of weight there, apparently. Oh, okay. She was not as big. Not getting as many boilies yeah, down there. no, <laughs> <laughs> there as many boilies. And, um, yeah, she lost a bit of weight and then died in, in October 1981. And then... They're long-lived, there. Well, carp are long-lived, aren't they? Very long-lived, yeah. Because yeah. she would have been a fair age, I would think, when... when um, oh, yeah, 44 Chris pound Chris carp Chase caught her, wasn't it? Was it Chris Yates that got her? Was it someone else? Dick Walker, then. Dick Walker. Oh, then, sorry, you did say Dick, yeah. I think they did. No, Chris Yates wouldn't have caught her subsequently, would he? Because that would have been. Because it got moved. Straight to but London he fished Red Meyer and got the record after him, the didn't he? Sorry, I'm. 52 I'm, pounds. That's it, I'm mixing them up. Sorry, I, I'll slap myself on the wrist for any angle he's shouting at their. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure their, he probably would have caught the offspring of yeah, Clarissa, that's yeah, for sure. And they're probably still in, the, still in the lake now. Yeah. Um, her, hopefully she can, I, the, can, I, can I touch the. Mm, so these are. Wow. These are just the pharyngeal jaws, or pharyngeal jaws, and, and basically the throat teeth. So they're quite large. They are. So they're base, for, So to kind of describe them to people, they're a little bit like molars, aren't mm. they, I guess? So exactly. that presumably is the same purpose. They're crunching yeah. Yeah. whatever, yeah. kind of Skin snails muscles, and stuff. muscles, I'd yeah. imagine, and crayfish. They probably didn't have that many crayfish. Well, no. maybe. Crayfish in there, but yeah. Wow. They're crunching up swan mussels, crayfish, anything in. hard and sort of processing... Put that back very gently, and I don't want to be the person that destroyed Clarissa's teeth. Oh. So, well, this, yeah, we we ended up with Clarissa's teeth, but the rest of where well, the rest of Clarissa ended up is a little bit of a mystery. Um, I'm sure some people out there know. Um, apparently, she ended up she was stuffed and mounted, and it's in a London tackle shop. Okay, for a while, but where she is now. Oh, so, so, so she no. got stolen, you think, or sold? No, no, or, I no. think probably sold. Oh, okay. So she's it's not it's not too cloak and dagger. Then it's just I don't know. It honestly. was um, okay. Yeah, that's be. some research for someone listening. Find out yeah. what happened to Clarissa. I'm sure it's. Uh, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's out there. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, very very famous carp. Yeah, so maybe, maybe they were just sort of taken off the off of display to yeah to prevent being stolen, kept in safekeeping. But possibly, yeah. Possibly. When she was mounted, obviously the um, yeah they would have taken up most of the insides. To do the, do yeah. the taxidermy correctly, so this is this is this is all we've, yeah, yeah, yeah. all we've ended up with. Um, it, it always surprises me when you see fish skeletons. When um, I think is it primarily? Oh, I suppose lots of fish have pharyngeal teeth, don't they? But cyp- yeah, cyprinids, yeah. they're quite yeah. pronounced, aren't they? Like mm. if you see on a chub, mm. it always surprises me because they're quite predatory. Mm. Like a, they're like a dagger, as mm. opposed to that's more like a molar. Yeah, these look just like. Very much like human molars, these. If you took that off and you put that on a table and said to someone, you know, that's that, <laughs> I coughed that up a minute ago, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, you, Maybe that could be from a, a slightly smooth. deformed person. Yeah, that's just but, yeah, but, um, milk tooth from a yeah, child. But that is incredible that carp, carp have those. It's almost looks like another barnacle, that one. That one looks very It does, flat. yeah, 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 yeah. Really flat. It's obviously been sort of ground down over the years of, um, I, I don't know what they fed her at London Zoo, but probably wasn't. Wasn't I don't know, yeah. Natural, natural diet. But they are big, they are. They're, they're amazing. Child, child's tooth sized. They're abs- yeah, they're absolutely, that's incredible. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that today. I, I, did, I, did, I think somewhere in the back of my mind I knew that you did have them, but yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't put two I've, I've never actually, I've not seen them myself, so it was quite oh, okay. exciting oh, to go and, oh, okay. oh, to go and fish them out. And we're very lucky because they're doing some renovation work in there. Oh, got you. And it, was kind of, it was out of bounds for a little while, and I managed to sniff. <laughs> sneak in and, and get them out. So yeah. Quite, oh, I'm glad you did. It's amazing to see them. It? But they're big. I mean, it's impressive. They are. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen mm. a, a carp's pharyngeal teeth. But that's not a strange sentence, really, isn't it? But <laughs> <laughs> to anyone else, that would be a strange yeah, sentence. But you can it's see not... how, like, yeah, using like boilies is no. Oh yeah, they're going to crunch that. Yeah, no, just, no problem, just, are they? Just down completely. They're going to they're gonna so, have yeah. that. So I mean, uh, there's so many specimens around us. Are there any other? I'll probably narrow it down to UK specimens, just because if we do worldwide, we'll be here all day. But are there any kind of UK specimens of weird and funky fish that you think... Well, this is very interesting. These are very new ones. Okay. This is, this is a very dull fish. It's a Bacurus. <laughs> this is a, shad or a scad or a... Um, yes, yeah, yeah. mackerel. Yeah. I collected this one myself, but this is also the most interesting thing about this specimen. It doesn't look particularly... It just looks like a scad. Yeah. But... Um, this is the first of its species to get its entire genome sequenced. 
Oh, OK. Part of the Darwin Tree of Life project to sequence the full, complete genomes of every UK species, which they're very busy. I was going to say, how long is that going to take you? <laughs> taking a while. I mean, yeah. fish, we have a fair few fish to do. Yeah. And they're getting... Well, we were, we were talking about this earlier, weren't we? Because I'm, I'm writing a book at the moment, and we were just saying, like, where do you stop? When, mm. when does a fish not become a British fish? Like, how far out to sea, yeah. or how deep do you, do you stop calling it British? Or do you count things that only turn up once or twice? It's such a, it's a yeah. minefield, isn't it? It's, it's really hard to do, yeah. You've got to, I mean, you've got the, you know, the political ba- boundary of, you know, what, 12 miles Yes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Offshore. Then you've got the sort of the more biogeographical boundary of just the edge of the continental shelf. Yeah. When it sort of drops off off the um, off the west coast of Ireland, and I say that I mean probably biogeographically is the most sensible thing. Yeah. But like you say, you get you get immigrants that um, migrants that come up. Yeah. On the um, on the Gulf Stream, and which of which I have a perfect example here. Do you have okay. any idea what that is? That was caught in the okay. UK in Somerset. In Somerset, okay. Is that a not a rock bass? Is it or? Um, nope. No. Okay. Um, well, you're putting me to shame, Rupert, because no, I don't, well, I don't know what fish it is. Go on, then. What is it? What I, I is it? I would have struggled to identify It looks like a tilapia, fish. but it's not a tilapia. It does look exactly like a tilapia. But it's not, is yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. This is a triple fin. Oh, okay. Or a triple tail. Triple tail. That makes you can sense. See yeah, that, it's got that very. A bit like a pike, in a way. Kind mm. of with the fins at the back, I mean. The back bit looks yeah. like a pike, but the rest of it does look. No, no, the tilapia. It does look, yeah, kind of flat. You're right. I was so, I, I, I was very curious when this thing came in. So and, and where's home for this guy? Then where, where are they? So, well, if you look at the scientific name, Lobotis Surinamensis. surinamensis. Okay. So these are from the Caribbean. Oh wow! So it's the very Eastern Atlantic. Right. Was it so alive when it was found? Yeah. All oh, right. So it wasn't wasn't dead and washed up. It no, was no, no, no. This, this living its best life, and then someone thought, "Let's chuck it in a jar in the Natural History Museum." <laughs> yeah. No. This case came <laughs> all the way across the Atlantic. Um, wow. I think you do get a few on around sort of the around North Africa. Okay. And this is obviously one of the whether it's come straight from the east coast or whether it's come from a sort of population around North Africa isn't entirely clear. No. But they don't. I think this is only the second one ever recorded in the UK. Wow. Do you know how it was caught? It wasn't rod and line, presumably. It, it no, was it was on a, uh, I think a shrimp. Shrimp, shrimp yeah. Shrimp okay. net. Yeah, that's a new... It's not Relatively right. recently, this was... Um, yes, yeah, so we only registered it in November here, and it was collected. You saw the information... 2019, the yeah. Um, collected, yeah, sept- so September and October are always the months where we get interesting fish. Because the sea's warmest. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. They come up on the, on the Gulf Stream. And here we go, here's another one. We've got this... Um, Oh, what is that? Amberjack. No, was that Corifina? I don't know what that one is. It's an amberjack, I think. Chesil Beach. Uh. Lots of strange stuff from Chesil Beach. Yeah, Chesil does seem to be a bit of a weird fish magnet, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so you see this guy. So that... Better there. Oh, it's like um, a... It's almost like a dolphin fish, isn't it, in a way? I don't know if they're the same family. I think it is. I'm getting, getting them mixed up there. Oh well, I'm not. I'm not going to call you out on it. So. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just very quickly check. Yeah, it does look a really weird looking, really weird looking fish. Very strange looking thing. But yeah, just it is. Just kind of describe it. You've just oh, got. Sure it's a dolphin fish. It is dolphin fish. Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. Yeah, oh good. Well, it's one one then, isn't it? Yeah, you you got. <laughs> I didn't know that one, but I knew that. One. So we we got a dolphin fish turned up in the UK. That's incredible. Yeah. That's absolutely some... incredible. Yeah. You're not going to believe this, what that thing is. Is that a bass? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ! It's fucking massive. <laughs> that the, jo- it does. The, the jar adds some I size. I mean, yeah. But you could put a saddle on that. Yeah. <laughs> Bloody so hell! That was. Uh, does it have a weight on it? So it says Isle of Wight, November 2007. Um, that would have been the record at that point. British angling record. Well, it's so that's the record. Angling. Jesus. Well, it's been broken since, but that is. That's enormous. Yeah. Bloody hell! I've not got a bass anywhere near that. That's huge. I mean, pound bass is a big fish. I mean, I'm trying to describe. I mean, I'm, I, it's got to be what? Yeah. Three foot bigger than least, that, longer than that. At least a meter. That's a beast of a bass. Mm, My the, God. Yeah. The, the, across the back, it's a good. It's like a good. God, I think I think I'd shit myself if I caught that. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and then we've that's, got. We've that's got, ridiculous. Imagine if you caught that thing. That was from Cornwall. 
Oh, what? Is it a bar- Barracuda? Is that a Barracuda? Yeah. yeah We've got Barracuda in the UK. Wow. Well, what? We had one. <laughs> one. <laughs> there, was, there was one. Wow. 2003. Six miles off the Lizard, southwest of Cornwall. I mean, surely, like, with, with, with climate change, stuff like this is, is going to become yeah, well. the norm, isn't it? Like, a lot more... Yeah. When, when you look at, you know, not even that far away, you look at the sea life you get around Brittany, mm. Bay of Biscay, it's, it's quite different to what we get. It's not going to take long, is it, for stuff to make its way up here, is it? Yeah, we've been getting lots, lots of two-banded sea brims. Oh yeah, yeah, I have, yeah, I have heard of those. Um, Loads. They've been turning up more, have they? Yeah, there have been very few of them in the sort of reported, historically in the collection. And now, in the last couple of years, we've had dozens, and obviously anglers are collecting, catching them a lot. And every time they catch one, they obviously break the record. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of record claims. So the record claims come here for that. Was it? You just, you just reminded me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So we don't deal with the freshwater fish so much; more the marine side of things. So. Well, there's more records, I guess. Isn't yeah, it? we try yeah. and it's and it's usually the sort of identification problems of people catching weird things and things that are not. Um, well, when you get different. into like bream and wrasse and stuff like that, they're they're a nightmare, aren't they? But but the LRF kind of community, these light light rock fishermen, they're getting pretty good at species hunting and knowing what's what. So I guess that's quite helpful, isn't it? And yeah, yeah, yeah. People, it's, um, it's but to get the record, I think you need you need independent confirmation of the species. You need a witness because I I was the record witness for someone oh. for the British record stickleback no yeah that's so my, my f- I know I know out of all the things I've done in my career <laughs> that's the one that'll be on my gravestone a friend stickleback witness yeah a friend we were fishing for cruisians and my friend caught a three spine stickleback and he was just about to chuck it back I went that's the biggest stickleback I've ever seen it was about three inches long probably wow. and, um, and he was like oh really and he, so he drove home got his kitchen scales weighed it and it weighed the same as a pound coin so I think that was nine grams because wow. we put a pound coin on the scales put the stickle back on the scales and he said should I claim that one yeah go for it why not so I was his witness it took him a couple of months but he did get it so he's, he's down there Matt Faulkner his name is if you google uh, record stickleback holder it was him and I and I was a witness wow. for it wow yeah that is, that's outstanding catching yeah I, I caught an absolutely huge um, sand smelt once oh yeah 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 I've seen those so before I don't yeah. know where, what the record for that well, one is well mini, mini species records must get broken all the time mm. because either anglers don't know any different or they can't be asked going for the rigmarole but I, I'm guessing like giant ble- uh, well lit- giant gobies or big blennies or maybe even big yeah. gudgeon I don't know people are like Meh, just throwing it back so mm. they, they probably get caught more more regularly than yeah, people yeah. realise yeah people just need to yeah, go through all the hassle of getting yeah I guess people scales it's probably because people don't want all the fame and fortune and, and you know all the, all the people knocking on the door from, from the attention of being a British record holder I'm, I would do it I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that's the thing yeah. I have uh, one thing I've not Notice yet is sharks. Have you, we oh, must have some sharks in here. Many, many sharks. Okay, many sharks. let's have a. Let, let's we have, have a some great white shark jaws. Just oh wow! Just here. These allegedly are the uh, one of the pairs of jaws that Peter Benchley of Jaws fame um, came to examine when he was researching for his book. Wow! He came round and you know that is huge. <laughs> the, got a real visceral idea of, of of what it would be like to be chomped on by one of these animals yeah you wouldn't you wouldn't know about it for long would you I think no. it would be a pretty what, what's your thoughts on? I always ask people this but what, what's your thoughts on great whites in the UK do you reckon I we... was very 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 disappointed to so we did a big study on using environmental DNA to detect shark species in the UK off the south coast ok so we detected lots of different sharks yeah all the ones that you'd that you think and you yeah. expect to be there, blues and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah, we had blue shark, not not too many, and poor beagles and uh, lots of rays, um, dogfish, of course. So it was really interesting and was really successful in terms of what we did find. But what we didn't find was any great whites, which yeah. I was very sad about because I thought it would be my fifteen minutes of fame <laughs> that I get. To, but we only sampled, you know, for one. You know, it was one year. And so in, only in one place. It was just yeah. around Plymouth. So, so know. chances are, if we have them, they're probably a very, very rare migrant yeah. sort of thing. I would not be surprised at all if one. No, I they would. should. They should be here by all accounts. No one's. Yeah, it's more surprising that they aren't here, isn't exactly, it? Yeah. That that's more the more the case. So there's a reason they're not here in any numbers, and it's obviously yeah, most likely. It's, you know, well, they're pretty rare, food. Isn't, it? isn't it? Something like I, I'm sure I read the, the total numbers. So there's only like three thousand of them. Or yeah. something like there aren't many, a so number. and they'll off, they'll congregate in places where there's really good food, you know, yeah, okay. California and um, South Africa, but other places they're they're still there. They're just not. Is that the record grayling? That 
It's a huge grayling. That is another absolutely. That's a stonking, stonking grayling. grayling. Earl of Dulcy. This we do have graylings from other countries, of course. Okay, Something but that like is an absolutely monster grayling. There's a whole grayling. letter in the bottom there. Yeah, these. That's an absolute beast. I mean, I am um, again. That's what like. Over two. Feet. This over two foot grayling. I mean, that that's a. It's a bloody big grayling. Be very careful. Oh God! <laughs> Let's. <laughs> There's a letter written in the bottom. Okay. The really exciting <laughs> bit about this is you sometimes find really, really interesting notes that people put in the jars. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. Oh, I, but it, it, these are not the I know of jars the, to manipulate. They're quite... If you listen to it. That's thin, isn't it? That is thin. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not gonna I don't want a face full of grayling. Any other day I'd be up for that, but um, yeah, not these, today. Because yeah. the record grayling got broken recently, so I don't think it's the current record. Oh, but. it does say... R test, which must mean river test. Ah, so that is a British grayling then? I think so. I can't yeah. read the whole note. There's a load of details there. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, and they look like char next to it. Are they char? Uh, yes, yes, they are. Yeah, Willoughby Eye. I mean, to be these, fair. These are from Windermere. This is on the, yeah, Windermere. Oh, God. Well, I mean, I'm surprised if there's any char left. If you've seen the state of Windermere at the minute, it's basically yeah. kind of green, isn't it? Ooh. With all the. Um, Pollution. I mean, to be fair, we could probably do a four-hour podcast of just going from going from tank to tank. Going, oh, look at that! Oh, look at that! Let's well, let's end on. Um, so we mentioned sharks. Let's let's have a look at a. Have we got a UK shark in a in a tank somewhere? What have we got? Got some more carp. Carp. Oh God, who's bothered about that? Right. Uh, God, it is just. I just don't know where to look because it's just. Um, that looks like a, a little bit like a shad there. I don't know if that is a shad. What is that? Oh, it's a milkfish. A milkfish? Oh. Chanos, that's an Asian. It was it, okay. Asian species. Maybe it's in the same family, perhaps. Um, no. No, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm trying to pretend that I know what I'm on about. Um, ah, I like these. these we've got these some rays. My, these are some of my favourites. This is, oh, it's another record. Oh, is that the cat... Cat. They've just catfish. opened it back up, haven't you? Is that right? That you can, you can maybe not you personally, but you. Um, we don't do the freshwater stuff so much here. No, really but yeah, you can. I think. Well, whoever decides the freshwater, because for years and years they they stopped the record because people kept importing cats mm. in. But because we've had catfish for so long now, they're sort of happy with that they can get to big sizes in the UK. Yeah, so, so I think it's now been reopened. So it's one of the older older ones. This is from True Reservoir. Doesn't say which one. Okay. Wilston, I guess. But the um, yeah. Um, do we have a date? Sometimes the dates are really helpfully hidden on a piece of card <laughs> that's inside the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Can't see Amazing looking thing. Though. Date on it, but yeah, it's a big old specimen. That's a good. It is. What's well, cat catfish are monsters, aren't uh, they? Is that forty pounds? Probably, yeah. When, when it's got its belly on it and yeah. and whatnot, they are they are incredible. Yeah, aren't so they? This one, this one, descendant of some of the original stock. Yeah, of course. So I think the. the Woburn, Woburn Abbey was the first, first location that's, that the Zandra yeah. and Wells were introduced. That's and then right. They yeah, spread to local, um, local reservoirs. Of course, yeah. The, the, um, I mean, they're in, they're in uh, my local River Trent now. So I mean, they're, they're in a, they're in a few rivers now, now, which we don't really want. So Torpedo ray there. Wow. Ah, yeah. So we're getting towards yeah. the, the shark we're getting sharky, here, aren't we? So this is more. Some, um, oh, some swordfish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Which are rather Cook, cookie, cookie cutter sharks. Oh, yeah, we got some cookie cutter. Wow, sharks. got a goblin. Is that a goblin no, shark? It's a goblin shark. My Indeed. God, yeah. This, I'm just going through my kind of ladybird book of sharks from when I was five, mm. trying to remember all the weird looking ones. Oh, no, it's not a goblin. It's a chimera. A chimera. Oh wow. Yeah, we, have, we do have a goblin shark over there. But you can see where I was coming from, yeah, can't you? Because it's got a big pointy sort of nose. Rostrum. Okay. Exactly. All right then. There was method to my madness. No, it does. I, mean, I thought it was one. Okay. Initially, but no, it's a chimera. Um, tigerfish are my favourites. Oh wow! Is that piranha family? Uh, piranha order. Order. Not okay. The same family, okay. But yeah. Okay. So these are yeah the African distant distant cousins. Distant, relatively distant cousins. Okay. Not, not too far away. No. Same order, but they're from yeah the African African side. These, unfortunately, very sad, are Chinese paddlefish, which are now extinct. Yeah, I, that wasn't that long ago either, was no, it? It was quite recent, a couple of years ago, I think. In the, um, that was in the news, which is very sad. So one of the benefits of the collection is that you know we have extinct. And like the burbot from the eagle. I mean, yeah. the burbots are not ex in the technical term; it's extirpated. Yeah. The um, so we have burbots globally, so they're not terribly rare globally. But in the UK, they're extirpated, and that's not exactly the same as being extinct. No, like but it's still important for like genetics but, and, and yeah. We can use the collections to 
take you know DNA samples from these older extinct. These are actually extinct. These these Chinese paddlefish. Yeah, that's there are no no living ones left. Um, so we've got porgy heads here. Are these por por beagles are they? Yes. Or that looks maybe a mako. I don't know. Yeah, I might be wrong. A, we have a mixture. Yeah. Right here. Okay. Did I get it right? Uh -huh, yes. Lamnanassus is the lower stuff that came from bloody hell. That was a very lost mako. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, that's if that was swimming at me, I would. That's yeah. A poor beagle, isn't it? Must be. Cack my pants, I think. But, um, uh, oh, no, no yeah, same. Poor beagle. Oh, that? Yeah, they're both poor beagles. No, they're both poor beagles, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, it's not on me. Oh, uh, okay. I think the mouth the mouth tricked me a little bit. <laughs> um, wait, any any um, sturgeon here from the UK? You got any sturgeon records? We have Stanley the sturgeon. Stanley? <laughs> which was. Um, do you remember Stanley the sturgeon? No, I don't. Who's I Stanley? Should I, should I know Stanley the sturgeon? It may have been a good 20 years ago now. It seems. It wasn't that long ago. There was a, a sturgeon. Um, Cropped up. I think it was in, it was in Wales, South Wales. Okay. It was a very, very big sturgeon. And obviously the sturgeons belonged at that point to the Queen. And so there was lots of legal sort of umming and ahhing and the, the question of who the sturgeon actually belonged to and the people that caught the sturgeon were trying to, you know, not break the law and the people that were selling the it was, it was complicated as the actual... You know, <laughs> custodianship of the sturgeon at the time. Eventually things got sorted out and the specimen made its way here. Ah. Is Stanley in a jar or is he in a box? So Stanley will be in one of these big steel tanks. All okay. this sort of tanking we... we see. We can, we're looking at the fish in the jars because obviously we can see them. Yeah. But the um, we also have a lot... The, the really big specimens are in the jar. Unfortunately we can't open... Uh, are in the, the tanks. No. We, we can't actually open them because the... The pulley winch, system the pulley, is... Yeah, the yeah, winch yeah. system is currently... Um, in the wrong part of the room to no, open the okay. tank. Otherwise, I'd love to show you inside one of them, but this is where the really big stuff is. So these tanks yeah. are good. There's, and there's a fair few of those dotted around yeah, with some sort of three or four big specimens. Long. And so Stanley is in one of these, in wow. one of these tanks. But the very interesting thing about Stanley is that it's not a British sturgeon. All right. And that was caught in Britain. So what was so it? We, so we have a European species of sturgeon. Yeah. Which everyone just assumed it was one of those. And they're, they're very rare, but they are present in, in I think they're um, one of the French rivers. Um, the Garonne. Yes. Or Garonne. Yes. Well, yeah. So there's a population there that's still still around. But we just thought, people just, you know, so it's, it's one of those. It's obviously, you know, it's migrated its way up here from, mm. from France. And, you know, this is all great, and everyone's happy to have Stanley here. <laughs> and, well, <laughs> no longer alive. It turned out they did some DNA work on Stanley, and it was not a European stand sturgeon at all. It was actually an American sturgeon. Very and lost sturgeon. All the way across the Atlantic. Wow. Yeah, but otherwise they look very, very similar. Yeah, because is it the Atl Atlantic sturgeon Atlantic they have over sturgeon, so, yeah. And they are similar, aren't they? Yeah. So that's incredible. Yeah, so Stanley's in one of these tanks. Good old Stanley. <laughs> but he was, yeah, he was, a, he was very famous at the time. This was good, yeah, more than 20 years ago, I think. No, I didn't. I'll have to go. I didn't. Yeah, yeah, I think there's some pictures on, online of... of this event, I mean, it was yeah. all over the papers, and it was wow. quite a big deal. I bet discovered these. Well, I mean, I, I could stay here all day and, and chat with people. I'm, I'm assuming that you have, uh, have got work to do at some point, so we should probably wrap up. But look, it's been an absolute pleasure to look around. I and mean, this is even we're just walking past a lot of reptiles now, which is my other great hobby and interest. Oh, so, there um, you go. yeah, I, you know, I, I am like a kid in a candy shop, but <laughs> but yeah, look, thanks for taking the time to show me around. This, this has been incredible. That was Rupert Collins at the Natural History Museum. That was amazing. I absolutely found that fascinating. Some of the specimens, well, I mean, I, I had a an inkling that Rupert might show me some Berbert. So to see Berbert in those tanks, uh, they're, they're kind of like tubes more than tanks, but really, really fascinating. I didn't think I'd get to see actual British Berbert, let alone uh, Clarissa's teeth. Now, again, if you're not an angler, you won't know the significance of that, but Clarissa was... A, a record carp and he's kind of known in angling literature as a, as a legend so to be able to actually hold her teeth was um was incredible so yeah that was that was amazing and all the other weird stuff i mean i, I could spend all day in there i'm sure there's loads of stuff that um, we didn't even get into which was which was just incredible now i mentioned that i would share a youtube video with you all so I did one recently on the waxwing eruption i'm sure many of you if you're into your wildlife 
will know that there has been a large increase in wax wings in the UK at the moment. And I headed out to Hassop Station near Bakewell, which has had over 300 wax wings turning up. So I got my camera, got my camera gear, went and had a look, and went to film them. There's a link in the description if you want to watch that, or you can go onto my YouTube channel, Chasing Scales, you can find it on there. I actually get recognised, which is really weird. Um, I was walking along and some guy went, you, you know, thought he knew who I was. I was like, oh, do I owe you money? No, and it was um, it was a guy who'd seen the YouTube channel, so that was really nice actually. And that, we caught that on camera, so you can watch you can watch me being very uh, very bashful as someone recognises me. Speaking of YouTube, I've also got a YouTube live coming up. So I used to do these kind of semi regular. I haven't done one for ages, but if you want to join me on YouTube live, twenty first of March, twenty twenty four, at half six, I'm going to be on YouTube live. Any of your questions that you want to answer. Well, you won't answer them, I'll answer them. Um, join me at that. I'll probably have a little uh, a beer or a whiskey or something as well. And we're just going to be talking about the YouTube channel, the podcast, um, some of the projects I've got coming up. Just a kind of informal chat between uh, me and you guys. So if you want to join me, that is the 21st of March at half six. And you can join me for a YouTube live. Now, next week, I am joined by Nicola Morris. She is a staff member of the RSPB, but she's better known for her wild swimming. She's an incredible wild snorkeler, and I thought it'd be really interesting to talk to someone else who goes in rivers about what they see, and she's found some pretty unusual stuff, um, and how they do it, permissions, etc., all that good stuff. So, join me next week for that. This has been the Bearded Tits Podcast. I've been your host, Jack Perks, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Cheers.